Under Wills, I've been a uPortal committer for a very long time, since 2004. Uh, I am happy to serve as a member of the uPortal Steering Committee. I've done that for a few years. In 2014, I was named uh, an Aperio Fellow, and I am a software architect at Unicon. In this topic, uh, there is a little bit of something for everyone. We have roughly the following agenda, roughly the following high-level topics. Uh, there are five of them, but they are very different in sort of scope or size. Uh, some are much larger than others. For starters, we want to talk about uPortal Start, which is a new component in the uPortal ecosystem for uPortal 5. Then we have a section on uPortal 5 for end users, followed by a section on uPortal 5 for uh, developers and administrators, probably the largest section. We have a smaller section on the uPortal ecosystem or updates from, you know, other updates from the uPortal ecosystem. And then the last section is on uPortal 5.1 and beyond. 5.1 is not released yet, but we have a loose expectation that it will be released in the next month or month and a half. Uh, but before we get started in earnest, uh, we wanted to take a quick look behind. These are some developments, uh, a small number of the, you know, uh, among the many developments that occurred in the period from uPortal 4.1 to 4.3. Uh, but these are things that, you know, if you don't know about them, we want there to be awareness of these things. Uh, for one thing, ever since uPortal 4.1, the user interface for uPortal implements a responsive design. It's based on Bootstrap 3. uPortal also offers support for multi-tenancy ever since 4.1. That means that uh, it, it offers sort of a portal in a portal experience. If you have a, if you have professional schools like a dental school, a medical school, a law school. Uh, a nursing school, uh, uh, any of these schools or, or maybe satellite campuses can have their own sort of portal within a portal experience. Typically that means uh, different branding or a variation on the branding and some different content and potentially permissions. Uh, uPortal, it, late in the uPortal 4 era, we added a six column layout option We'll see more about that later. That has, uh, a, that's of particular interest when you have large amounts of small items uh, on a single page. We made a number of, uh, this is more of a theme, we made a number of improvements to the uPortal administrative interfaces in this period. And we also made a, um, a pretty sizable number of performance improvements in this period. All right, the first section of this presentation is on uPortal Start. And what is uPortal Start? That's really the question we have to answer in this section. We have to make sure that uh, people don't know what, uh, that we have uPortal Start and they know what it is. A great way to um, kick off that discussion is to point out that uPortal Start is a Git repository. Over there, uh, top right, you can see the URL for this Git repository. Uh, it's on GitHub, and uPortal Start is a new component for uPortal 5. It is, it is the means through which you implement uPortal 5. It, uh, using uPortal Start, you can create and maintain your configuration, your data, your skin, and even your deployments by using a suite of, of CLI, command line interface tools that give you the tasks that you need in order to be successful with these items, your configuration, your data, your skin, and packaging your deployments. With uPortal 5 and with uPortal Start, you no, no longer need to fork, modify, or build the core uPortal source code. Everyone who adopts uPortal 5 has the opportunity to use the same uh, uPortal binaries that are built and published by Aperio by the community of, of uPortal developers. However, I, I have this parenthetical remark, it is still 100% possible to produce and use uh, private releases or private builds of uPortal if that's what you want to do. Information on using uPortal Start is uh, available in the README. It's a pretty comprehensive README, pretty long. It is a pretty 
you know, it, it is accurate and it contains detailed information for working with uPortal Start. You can see that this screenshot uh, illustrates this README file in French. The README is, uh, for uPortal Start is even available in French. The next section is on uPortal 5 for end users. This is a shorter section. It, has only, it covers only a handful of items. Uh, and that's because the major thrust of uPortal 5 really wasn't about uh, new end user features. You'll see when we come to the next section what uh, we spent our, the most of our time on. But there are features for end users. End users are not left out uh, of uPortal 5, and we need to cover those. To start with, we have a new standard for accessibility in uPortal 5, and this is pretty cool. The new target for accessibility guidelines is WCAG 2.0 level AA, and it's not merely the case that this is a new target. We, a significant effort went into auditing and remediating accessibility uh, issues and compliance uh, with uPortal at the end, at sort of the tail end of 2016 and the beginning of 2017. Uh, Unicon and others uh, poured a large effort into uh, analyzing, catalog cataloging, and updating the usability of uPortal. Uh, and this effort uh, and this standard applies to uPortal itself as well as all the bundled content modules, the other sort of open source Aperio content modules that uh, are commonly included with uPortal, it covers all of those. Another user-facing feature is that we, there were a number of updates or enhancements to the favorites portlet. Uh, you can see a screenshot here. Uh, for one thing, we added icons uh, next to each item in the list in the favorites portlet. You can see that illustrated here. Uh, and later, after, after the 5.0 release, we also added the stars that you see on the right-hand side. These are clickable stars. If you click on the star, it uh, removes the item. You know, the star goes uh, empty, and the item gets removed from your favorites list. Another update, uh, user-facing update for uPortal 5 is that we rebooted, retooled the administrative dashboard. Uh, the new dashboard is based on app launcher style portlets. These, uh, each of these will take you to a, an administrative tool within the portal, things like the, uh, the portlet manager or the groups manager. We felt that this experience uh, for accessing the admin tools was plenty compelling. And in addition to that, we were looking to include in the default data a page with lots of app launchers like this one because it's becoming a, a common approach to implementing content in uPortal and we before this new dashboard we didn't have an example. Another user-facing enhancement is that we added the ability to manage the configure permission directly into the portlet manager. Previously, you had to manage this permission if you wanted to use this permission. You had to manage it either in the permissions manager, which was a little tough, it's kind of obtuse, or by using import-export, by editing you know, data files and importing them. In uPortal 5, we've added the configuration or you know, the management of the configure permission directly to the portlet manager. And there are, you know, several other user-facing items that are not as significant in uPortal 5. You know, we've added a number of additional and better icons for various things. We added support for the alternative maximized link to the sitemap. We adjusted the size uh, and, you know, layout of, of various elements to improve them. Let's see. And, and of course, we also knocked out uh, a large number of bugs for the uPortal 5 release. That brings us to the next section, which is, which is I'm certain, the largest. And this is uPortal 5 for developers and administrators. Really, a lot of work went into this area for uPortal 5. 
And at a very high level, uh, the principal aim, sort of the main theme or thrust of the work in this area for ePortal 5 is making things easy. It was uh, felt, you know, historically we have often received the feedback that uh, there is too much learning curve in order to be effective with ePortal. Uh, that new new people, uh, you know, even experienced developers need to learn too many things, too much arcane platform knowledge in order to work with ePortal and to be effective with ePortal. And so we were, uh, you know, especially interested in reducing this learning curve, making it easier for new people to work with the portal. You know, this, this concept of easier, it plays out on, in a number of ways, on a number of levels. We wanted to make ePortal easier to set up locally, you know, to work on a, a local development environment. We wanted uh, to make it easier in ePortal 5 to configure your implementation choices. We wanted to make it easier to skin the portal. We want to make it easier, a lot easier if we can, to develop new custom content components for uPortal 5. We want to make it easier to deploy uPortal. We want to shorten the delivery pipeline. Another piece of criticism that we received uh, a fair amount was that uh, new rollouts into production would take too long. They took uh, you know, too much time on the clock and the participation of too many people and, and too much energy. They were just you know, too big an effort. Uh, we want to make uh, uPortal easier to run in the cloud. We want to push uPortal towards cloud native. And we also want to make uh, uPortal easier to update. If you're running a uPortal based service and new releases come out, it should be very easy to apply those. So in you know, a number of bullets, eight or nine, you know, these items outline our goals for making uPortal easier for developers and administrators in uPortal 5. And if we can do these things, if we accomplish these aims, we hope, we believe, that you, know, you that uPortal adopters, uPortal 5 adopters, will be radically more productive and more successful than with any previous version. Uh, so another nod to our friends in the French community, uPortal 5. There is a new manual for uPortal 5, the uPortal 5 manual, uh, and it features a French version. Uh, the URL in the left-hand column, jsig.github.io slash uPortal slash fr, that's the location to point your browser to to uh, examine the documentation in, in French and a big thanks to our friends uh, in the ASIP community, Christian and Julian, for making that possible. All right, the next big change in uPortal 5 for administrators and for developers. We have a brand new build system. Actually, as you'll see in you know, more further in this section, this change sort of underpins uh, a lot of the other changes that, you know, sort of make up the great advantages of uPortal 5. In previous versions of uPortal, in, in uPortal 3 and 4, all releases, uPortal had a, a build system based on two tools. Those tools were uh, Ant and Maven. In uPortal 2, the build system was based on Ant. In uPortal 3, we, you know, sort of just like the rest of the industry, we wanted to adopt Maven as a build tool, but we never completely managed to get some of the things that we were doing with the build system off of Ant and into Maven. So the result was that we had this, this sort of uncomfortable hybrid build system that was based on both Ant and Maven. And as a, a developer or a, a builder or deployer of uPortal, you were obligated to install both Ant and Maven on your machine. So the previous build system employed two build tools. The new build system for uPortal 5 employs one. That build tool is Gradle. It's, it's a more modern, sort of very powerful, tremendously flexible build tool uh, for software, software projects, especially uh, Java-based projects, but not exclusively. And in uPortal 5, with the Gradle-based build, you're not obligated to install any tools at all. And that is because uPortal 5, the Gradle-based uh, build system, is based on a, uh, a Gradle wrapper, which is included directly with the project. And 
you know, it's updated and maintained by the community of developers. So it, you can count on the tool that's included with the project itself to be, you know, properly configured, properly set up, and the correct version. The new build system is easier to use and understand for newcomers and old hands alike. It's more intuitive, sort of better laid out. It's, it's also more flexible. Uh, you can see here, sort of fourth line from the bottom, there's an example of a, a build command that you can issue in the new build tool. And it, you know, sort of individually deploys the calendar portlet to Tomcat. This is something that was not uh, feasible in the previous build tool. Uh, it was something that was very difficult to do. If you wanted to deploy a bundled portlet, like the calendar portlet or maybe the announcements, notification, you were obligated to uh, build and deploy them all. With the new build tool, you can, you can do any operation. Uh, this operation, uh, a build operation, a test operation, you can even use database import export for one, one module at a time. It's also more powerful. The new build tool takes on more scope than the previous ePortal build. There are things that we're doing in the new build tool that folks in the community would do and did do and were successful with. But we've, in the era of ePortal 5, we've undertaken to do these sort of things together. And one of those things is to set up and operate the servlet container, the Tomcat container, in which uPortal runs. Uh, lastly, but very significantly, the new build system is much, much faster than the previous one. Uh, build times are significantly reduced. It's much more of a joy to use. uPortal 5 also has, uh, you know, and in connection with this new build tool, uPortal 5 offers a significantly simplified setup process. There are only pre two prerequisites. There are two things that you need to have on the machine in order to work with uPortal 5 in the traditional way. I'll show you another way in a few slides. But in the traditional way, there are only a couple things you need. You need a, a JDK, a Java development kit uh, for Java 8, uh, and you need a, a Git client. You need uh, Git software installed on the machine. And in the bottom, in sort of the gray box, you can see illustrated the process of getting started with uPortal 5 and uPortal Start. You clone the uPortal Start repository, Git repository. There's the URL for that right there. Uh, once you clone it, you can cd into the directory for uPortal Start, the one, the directory that gets created by the clone command. And then once you're inside that directory, you can run, you know, this single command, these two Gradle tasks. The first one, portal init. The second one, portal open. If you, if you do those things, the whole portal will be, you know, downloaded, packaged, deployed. The database schema will be, well, the database, the embedded database server will be started uh, the database schema will be created. It will be populated with data. The Tomcat uh, instance, the, the servlet container, will also be downloaded and installed uh, and completely configured and set up. The uPortal software will be deployed to it. Uh, Tomcat will be started. And uh, lastly, once all these things are done, uh, your browser will, the build system will launch your browser uh, a new tab in your browser and point it to the uPortal running locally at uh, localhost 8080 slash uPortal. And you will be presented directly with a page that looks like the one on the right. Also in uPortal 5, uh, we offer a new simple and succinct skinning process. The nuts and bolts, the mechanics of skinning uPortal are not dramatically different from uh, uPortal 4, uh, they're very similar, but the build system offers tooling to get you started and get you started properly. We discovered that in creating a new skin, in creating the files that make up a new skin, the source files, 
and getting them connected properly, there was a fair amount of confusion and there were a number of opportunities to, to sort of mess it up. So we implemented a, a new Gradle task called Skin Generate that can uh, you know, sort of kick off the process of skinning ePortal for you. You use a command like this one, Gradle W, that stands for the Gradle wrapper. The task is skin generate, and you pass an argument like this, dash capital D, skin name equals name. And that could be anything you like. Uh, you know, that could, you know, could be my you, it could be if your mascot is a cougar, it could be my cougar. Uh, the name of the skin, the name you want to give the skin for your portal. This command will produce a, a number of source files, will generate a number of source files in your tree. Once it does, all you need to do is go in uh, to the files it creates and, and start to edit them uh, in the manner that you want to, to implement the skin of your choosing. Uh, two of those files are variables.less and skin.less. These are sort of the main primary skin files for a portal skin. The styling is, is based on less CSS. You, in variables, you can define things like uh, colors or backgrounds, borders for parts of the portal page and for, uh, for portlets and so forth. And then in skin.less, it's a file that, that starts out empty, but in skin.less, you can override the style rules uh, in, in your portal 5 that you want to go in a different direction with. It's an opportunity to uh, override the styling rules that, that come by default with your portal 5 and make them into the rules that match uh, your, your design, your brand. Your portal start automatically compiles these less files. It uh, knows where these less sources are and it has a really neat system for uh, compiling uh, your less sources into CSS. By combining them with other less sources from Bootstrap, which uh, the Bootstrap sources come by way of a web jar and uh, from uPortal itself. We offered skin compilation, less compilation in uPortal 4 as well, but the uPortal 5 version of it uh, offers a number of improvements over the previous version. For one thing, uh, instead of checking the Bootstrap sources directly into the uPortal repository, all the Bootstrap technology comes from a, a web jar downloaded from Maven Central. Uh, and in addition to that, the previous solution for compiling less was based on a less Maven plugin, which often did not include or support the latest version of less. The new approach uses Node directly and directly uses uh, less C, the, the native less compiler. Another improvement for developers and administrators is that uh, uPortal 5 and uPortal Start support baked-in Tomcat setup and configuration. In previous versions of uPortal, anyone who wanted to run a local copy was obligated to go to the Apache website and obtain a copy of Tomcat, to download it, to set it up, install it locally on the disk, and to make a number of configuration changes to support uPortal. All of that happens automatically with uPortal 5, which is a great thing because, uh, historically speaking, we would get a significant volume of emails uh, to, to the uPortal user list, requests for you know, help or clarification in, in these processes. Uh, so in uPortal 5, we tackle Tomcat setup as a community. It's, uh, it's not a thing that we ask every individual to solve and become an expert in. It's something that we, we tackle as a community and, and we tackle in uPortal Start. So everyone who comes to uPortal 5 can benefit from the experts in the community working together to make this process uh, as, as polished and as um, issue-free as we can. The CLI tools, the, uh, the build system, provides a number of tasks for working with Tomcat. One of, the, one of those is Tomcat install. This is a Gradle task that uh, knows how to download the proper version of the top Tomcat servlet container 
and set it up locally on disk within the uPortal Start uh, project. Uh, we also have Tomcat Deploy, which you've seen on other slides. That Gradle task uh, knows how to take the built modules within uPortal Start and put them in the right place within Tomcat. The next items are uh, Tomcat Start and Tomcat Stop. Uh, these do what they look like they do. They start and stop uh, the servlet container. Uh, there are also two tasks, Tomcat Tar and Tomcat Zip, that allow you to produce you know, a package, an archive, a tar, or, or a zip, respectively, so that you can take that uh, archive and directly move it to a server somewhere and deploy it and, and set up ePortal to run on a server. Uh, you know, second to last bullet on, on this slide, this is really the important bit. Uh, the fact that ePortal start takes on uh, this scope, takes on these tasks uh, and, uh, and management of the Tomcat container. It moves the process of setting up Tomcat uh, from something that is individually managed, requiring everyone to have uh, a certain amount of expertise, to something, to an activity that is uh, community managed, uh, something that we can get right together and work on together, and everyone can benefit from the community version. Last bullet, it is uh, completely possible to set up Tomcat in the old way, but we hope that you will join us in doing it in the new way. We have a couple new configuration patterns in New Portal 5. For, for reasons that I'm about to outline, the old ways that we would configure uPortal for sort of uh, local implementation, they don't support the, the new things that we want to do with uPortal, uh, the new ways that we want to uh, approach packaging and deployment. The new configuration patterns are a very significant departure from the past. In the past, uPortal 4 and 3 even, we would have uh, filters, files, we would use Maven filters, and we would, we would bake configuration settings, we would bake environment-specific configuration settings into uPortal in the build process. We don't do that anymore. Environment-specific settings are not included in the build, and we'll see more about that in just a little bit. But uh, I say uh, new configuration patterns, plural, uh, because there are really more than one uh, you know, new pattern to, to talk about. There's one new pattern for Java properties and, and a separate one for configuring spring beans. Uh, Java properties are simple uh, properties files. They're key value pairs, a, a string key on the left, followed by an equal sign, followed by a value. These are pretty easy to manage. There are a number of Java properties, a large number of Java properties that uh, uPortal uses. And there's, there's always a default value for these properties in uPortal 5. And in a lot of cases, the default value is perfectly suitable. But certainly there are um, you know, a handful or, or a dozen or more uh, of these properties that are not you know, where the default is not suitable, where uh, in order to succeed at uh, becoming uh, the campus portal, these, these defaults need to be changed. And in uPortal 5, that can be done with these properties files, new properties files, that live in a directory called portal home. The default location of the portal home directory is, is a directory called portal inside the root directory of the, the Tomcat servlet container, but it doesn't, the portal home directory does not have to be there. You can use uh, an environment variable called portal home, all caps with an underscore. You can see it here on the slide to point to any directory on disk, and that can be uh, the place where these, uh, where the portal home properties files live. All of these files are optional. But in Portal Home, you can place a file called global.properties, uh, and you can place a file called uPortal.properties. And you know, for the other modules that you're using with uPortal 5, like the calendar or the announcements, you can place additional files in there, typically one for each of these. 
Uh, as you may imagine, the global.properties file uh, is sourced, the properties in there, in there are read by all of the modules, or potentially all of the modules. They may be read by all of the modules in uPortal 5 in the servlet container. In contrast, uPortal.properties will only be read by uPortal and calendar.properties will only be read by the calendar portlet and announcements.properties will only be read by the announcements portlet and so forth. Uh, in this way, you can take the uh, environment specific properties, things like your database connection settings, your LDAP connection settings, perhaps API keys that you use to reach out to APIs on campus. Uh, you can take these environment specific things, these things that are different for production, different from, from test or, and, um, and from staging environments and so forth, and you can put them in these files. And the values you place in the portal home directory will override the values that exist in the build. Lastly, the other configuration pattern that is new for uPortal 5 is for SpringBeam. Java properties are great. Uh, they carry us really far. Uh, a number of things, perhaps a majority of things in uPortal can be configured with Java properties, but there are some things that just can't. A great example is uh, user attribute data sources the configuration of uh, sort of person directory, the configuration that in previous versions of uPortal was in person directory context.xml. Uh, these things are not properties, they're really structures. They're structures of Java objects that are managed by the, by the Spring application context. Uh, in other words, they are uh, Spring beans. And in uPortal 5, we still need to be able to configure spring beams, but we have a new pattern for doing that. And that is this. There are certain uh, Java interfaces, certain uPortal interfaces, that if you, if you implement them, if you provide an implementation of that interface in the spring application context, uPortal will find it, uh, and it knows what to do with it. So for example, an iPerson attribute DAO, this would be a data source for user attributes. If you define one, if only you define one and get a properly configured uh, beam that implements that interface into the application context within uPortal, which you can easily do with uPortal start, the uPortal software will find it in the application context and it will put it in the right place. It will connect the dots between it and, its, and, and the things that depend on it. And it will become a part, uh, automatically become a part of your portal implementation. Uh, so those are two new configuration patterns for uPortal 5. They are a significant change from the way we did things in previous versions. Uh, but this is important. Uh, this sets us up for this new enhancement to what we're doing with uPortal 5, this concept of package once, deploy anywhere. uPortal 5 builds are not environment specific. You know, the filters files are gone. There's no, there's no environment specific information that needs to be in the uPortal web app at all. So you are free to produce builds to produce packages of uPortal 5 and deploy them on any environment. You can deploy them locally, you can deploy the same binaries to dev environments, test environments, and even production environments without rebuilding or without building on each server for every server, which was a very uh, typical way to handle deployment in previous versions of uPortal. This change, this very significant change, should shorten the delivery pipeline quite a bit. Uh, you can use Tomcat tar or Tomcat zip to archive a package of uPortal 5 that is ready to deploy to any of these environments, or even better, you can leverage the new uh, support for Docker images that has been added to uPortal start. This is one of the latest, you know, most recent developments in uPortal Start. We have added the ability to produce Docker images based on uPortal directly from the build system. Uh, uPortal Start actually knows how to build three different images. The main one is simply called uPortal. 
that is a, a simple, a relatively lightweight image that contains only the Uportal web server. The second Docker image is called Uportal CLI. Uh, it has the web server, but it also includes Gradle, uh, the Gradle tool, and it in includes all the CLI tools. So you can use Uportal CLI if, for example, you want to use a Docker image to do database import export commands in the Amazon cloud. Lastly, we have a, an image called uPortal Demo. This is the third and final Docker image that uPortal Start knows how to produce. uPortal Demo, it, as the name suggests, it's a demonstration version of uPortal. It is the spiritual successor of the old, uh, of the quick start distributions of uPortal that we used to produce in four and three, uPortal four and three. UPortal Demo is not suitable for implementing UPortal at all, but it is suitable for quickly launching a copy of UPortal locally and kicking the tires and sort of evaluating UPortal, taking, taking a look at UPortal, uh, what it can do, how it works, you know, what the uh, navigation options look like, what the administrative tools look like. And you can do that in a single command. You, you know, I have it here on the bottom of the slide. Docker run... Uh, dash it dash lowercase p 8080 colon 8080 and then a perio slash u portal dash demo uh, on the right you can see a screen capture we have started publishing these u portal demo images to docker hub and if you use a command like this one at the bottom without any u portal software installed at all without u portal start without even java install or you know, without the get client, uh, you will need Docker installed. But if you run, if you have Docker installed, if you run a command like this, you can see uh, in in just a few minutes, you can see a fully functional demo version of uPortal running on you know locally in your environment at uh, port eighty eighty. Uh, next item. Uh, new uh, an enhancement in uPortal 5, de new developments in uPortal 5 for uh, administrators and developers. Uh, we have a new standard for pluggable content in uPortal. uPortal 4 and up, 4.0 and up, support both JSR 168 and JSR 286, so versions 1 and 2 of the Java portlet specification. UPortal 5 also supports both of these standards, and, and in fact, UPortal comes with, UPortal 5 comes with, a number of, uh, of Java portlets bundled, pretty much the same Java portlets that were bundled in UPortal 4. But the, the story of, uh, you know, sort of the era of Java portlets is not, Java portlets are not really the approach to content that we are looking to leverage for the next two, three, five years of uPortal, you know, in the uPortal community. We are more interested in exploring new ways of de developing content for uPortal. Developing Java portlets is significantly complex. It, you know, again, it has a a significant learning curve. It's hard to train new Java portlet developers, uh, especially so because there really aren't people interested in writing uh, Java portlets in 2018 and beyond. You know, because the process of doing so is complicated and arcane, and also because Java portlets are sort of fundamentally hardwired into the notion, into the concept that every operation with the portal is a, a full page round trip and replacement. We don't really build things for the web that way anymore. You know, we're mostly not interested in building things that way in 2018 and beyond. And so in portal, we're exploring uh, new ideas about what content looks like in the portal. And Soffits is an important one of those. UPortal Soffits, it's a new standard for pluggable content. It doesn't have a complicated request lifecycle like portlets. Uh, it's not uh, significantly weird, and so it is more, more friendly to modern development frameworks, things like Spring Boot. Soffits are not required to run inside UPortal's Tomcat container, which is a tremendous bonus. 
because uh, you know portlets, both both version one and two, they are, uh, and even channels, the the standard for pluggable content that ePortal had before portlets, they were also required to run uh, in the same Java process. Soffits can run externally, not on the same, not in the same Tomcat, not in the same Java process. They don't even have to run on the same host. Uh, and therefore, when you are developing soffits or adding uh, new soffits, you don't need to constantly stop and restart, stop, redeploy, and restart the portal environment to uh, update your soffits or to see the changes in something you're working on. So they're a lot more fun to work on as a developer. Uh, you don't need to, when you need to update a soffit or add new ones to a running production service, you don't need to. Uh, take that service offline in order to do so. And in fact, soffits, at the end of the day, soffits are not actually required to be built in, in Java-based technology. They don't have to run in a JVM at all. It would be perfectly feasible to have soffits in, in Go or in PHP or in Node. Uh, soffits, you know, continuing in the strong uPortal tradition of being front-end technology agnostics, agnostic soffits uh, need not be written using React or using Angular or using Vue or any specific front-end technologies. Uh, link at the bottom, you can, if you go to this address, you can see uh, a number of sample soffit applications that we have in the Aperio community. Uh, next item, uh, new, another enhancement that benefits uPortal adopters, uPortal uh, administrators, and uPortal developers. We have added API documentation based on Swagger to uPortal. Uh, it is something that you just need to turn on. It's very easy. It's a single property, and you will be able to access an interface uh, like this one. The Swagger tooling, uh, you know, the Swagger support offers two key benefits. For one thing, it's documentation that you can read, review, and browse and explore. For another thing, the Swagger documentation is actually a lightweight client for invoking the APIs, for passing arbitrary parameters, and for inspecting the results. So it makes it easy to, you know, sort of work with the APIs as a developer and figure out what they do and how they behave. Uh, it turns out, and I'm not sure anyone had counted before, but it turns out there are 23 different APIs in uPortal. That covers the section on uPortal 5 enhancements for administrators and for developers. There are two more sections. And this next one is on the uPortal ecosystem. There's one thing in particular that we want to highlight for, you know, sort of changes coming down the pike with uPortal 5. Many folks in the community are familiar with a uPortal ecosystem component called uPortal Home. Uh, this is a new alternative uh, front end, it's sort of a new dashboard experience for uPortal 5 developed by the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It is based on Angular JS, and it offers a uh, an attractive, intuitive way to access content in the portal. We are working on bundling uPortal Home directly with uPortal Start. There is a, a pull request in process for this effort. There are a number of participants, a relatively large number of participants, six of us working on this pull request. And if you check out the branch, you know, if you pull down the branch that this pull request is based on and you build it and launch it locally, then you will be able to see a uPortal home interface that looks like this one. Uh, you can see it's blue. The original one from the University of Wisconsin is, is red and it has their logo and, and their branding. But the, the one that comes with uPortal by default or will when we merge this pull request. It has more of an Aperio theme. It has the blue. It, it much more matches the default uPortal experience based on Responder. We would have the pull request merged by now, and it would be something that is you know, already available with uPortal Start, except there are 
just a couple of things that we feel need to happen in order for it to match uh, the other things we're doing with uPortal Start. And the most important of these, and the thing that is the most significant barrier, is this uh, WCAG 2 level AA accessibility. We've gone to a lot of trouble uh, to target WCAG 2 level AA guidelines as a new accessibility standard. Uh, and so we're very hesitant to merge something in by default uh, where we're unsure of its compliance with those, those guidelines. Uh, UPortal Home, uh, I'm, you know, the message is really not that the accessibility is poor. It's, the message is really that we haven't audited and remediated it. Uh, and we intend to address this question of WCAG2 level AA accessibility ahead of merging it with ePortal Start. We also have some plans. Uh, that, that first bullet item is the big one. We also have some plans to create uh, some new data uh, to drive the ePortal home experience. Uh, it, it turns out, and, and this is not a surprise, that the, the kinds of um, uh, layout data that makes sense in Responder are, uh, are not necessarily a match for what makes sense uh, out of the box in uPortal Home. So we intend to set up a, a special fragment for uPortal Home content before we merge it. Uh, that's not a, a big effort. We'll be able to do that pretty much at any time. The last bullet, those of you who are observing closely may recognize that the screenshot that I have in this slide deck, it does not illustrate using widgets uPortal Home uh, supports a, another new standard for portal content called widgets, uh, and they're you know attractive and they're more interactive. And the the bundled uPortal Home does not yet quite uh, support them effectively. That is owing only to a, a minor mismatch in the APIs that come with uPortal out of the box and uh, the you know, corresponding APIs that ePortal Home expects. Uh, we are working on resolving that mismatch uh, as we can, but even without widgets, merging uh, ePortal Home into ePortal Start would be an advantage, and we're prepared to do that. All right, lastly, a few slides, a few topics uh, related to what we're doing with ePortal beyond version 5.0. Uh, what are some things that are coming down with Pike that are sort of significant new features that won't be a part of the, the 5.0 line, but will be a part of future versions of uPortal like 5.1? And I'll say again what I said in the beginning, that we, we have a loose expectation that the 5.1 release of uPortal is actually relatively uh, imminent. It may, you know, it may be with us uh, as early as, you know, sort of the tail end of February, or perhaps uh, sometime in March. So it's, it's not too far away. So coming up in, in 5.1 and beyond, one thing that, uh, we, that we have ready, this item is actually merged already, is new layout options based on CSS Flexbox. And I have some slides to illustrate that change that we're gonna see in just a moment. Uh, another item that is also already merged, we converted finally, something that we had hoped to do ever since ePortal 4.1, but we converted the sitemap that's in the footer area of the portal, we converted it to a portlet. Uh, it looks virtually identical to before, but we converted that to a portlet. It's based on the uh, existing ePortal REST APIs for layout content. And you know, now that it is a portlet, that makes it very easy to remove it instead of making uh, an XSL change to remove it, you merely have to either delete the portlet or take the portlet out of the DLM fragment where it becomes part of the user's layouts or change the permissions to it. And furthermore, changing the permissions uh, to it, you now have the ability to give some users the uh, sitemap at the bottom of the page and, and others not. The last item, this last bullet is not merged yet. It's a work in progress. But we are working on new, uh, some enhancements to, to DLM. We're working on enhancements to the uPortal layout subsystem that allows us to uh, match content in the portal 
uh, with users based on pluggable strategies. And you know, in, in performing that matching, in implementing those strategies, we can use contextual information both about the user and about the content objects in the portal, as well as you know, more, more innovative things like data from learning analytics. Yeah, this is really exciting, and I have content on that item as well coming up shortly. All right, uh, some of you in the community will have seen these uh, GIFs, but this page, and or this slide, I should say, and the next, they illustrate the, the new feature layout, layout options based on CSS Flexbox. So when this thing, when this GIF is at full width like now, you can see that what we have here is a six-column layout, one of the newer six-column layouts that is full of app launch reportlets, except these app launch reportlets have not been arranged into even rows. Uh, some rows have five or six portlets, some rows have zero portlets, and uh, you know there's a row with one, a row with two, and so forth. It's jagged, it's sort of snaggletoothed. The page looks very uneven, the white space is kind of unpredictable and unattractive. So it is easy to arrange portlets evenly in six column layouts or, or three or two column layouts uh, for that matter. But this kind of situation, it tends to arise when you have a page of uh, app launcher portlets. They typically are app launcher portlets. A large page of them, you know, maybe 30, 40 portlets on the page where the portlets any individual user will see you know, are tailored extensively based on role or user attributes or group affiliations. On the fragment as a whole, on the page, the way an administrator sees it, there might be, you know, 30 or 40 portlets, but when a real user logs in, a student or a faculty member, a staff member, a graduating student, perhaps a prospective student, when a real user logs in, you don't see all the portlets, you see only a fraction of the portlets. In those cases, it's tough to predict how, you know, sort of which columns will be missing how many portlets. And you end up with situations like what you see on the screen right now. And it's pretty unattractive, and uh, this is actually an issue that's been with us really since Responder, uh, since about 4.1. Uh, and we've all, you know, ever since then, we've been very interested in uh, a good way to deal with uh, this and present this content in a more attractive way. Well, in uPortal 5.1, we have new layout options based on CSS Flexbox. Uh, so on this new slide, this is also an animation. You can see essentially, here you can see essentially the same content, but in the new six column, you know, six column grid layout option uh, based on CSS Flexbox. It's easy to see that the same content uh, is attractively arranged, and you know, no matter which portlets you have, they are always predictably arranged into a grid. Uh, and that grid, you can see as this page expands and shrinks, that you know the number of elements in the grid uh, grows and shrinks based on the display size, you know, per the tenets of, of responsive design. Uh, so what's going on here? Traditional uh, layouts in uPortal have always been based on columns. In, until uPortal 4.1 and later we only had one, two, three, and four column layouts. When we started working with these app launchers like you see on this page, we added a six column option for layouts. Uh, but again, Historically, they've always been based on columns, and these columns uh, work, they always work the same way. Content floats to the top. So if you have uh, three portlets in the first column, uh, it, you know, it will go one, two, three down from the top, and if you have two uh, portlets in the second column, it will go one, two down from the top, and there will be a missing one in, in the third uh, position of the second column. The as long as our layout options were exclusively based on columns, these, these unattractive gaps, like I showed you on the previous slide, uh, they were difficult to eliminate. At least they were difficult to eliminate when 
the portlets that would appear for any particular user were, were difficult to sort of work out. So in the new layout options based on CSS Flexbox, every layout based on Flexbox is actually a single, is technically, as far as ePortal knows, it's a single column layout. It just has a Flexbox grid applied to it. And you have options. There are uh, a number of options. There's a two, a uh, three, a four, and a six column grid option. Uh, each of those uh, ha has been added to the layout options in the personalization gallery when you access the, uh, the customized drawer, as you see you know, the button for that customized right here on this slide. So on these slides, I only have illustrations of what app launchers uh, with no Chrome, uh, with the no Chrome option, what they look like. But I can mention that traditional content, things like the announcements portlet or the, the news reader or the calendar, uh, they also actually look pretty good in the new Flexbox layouts as well. Uh, they look pretty good provided that the items on the page are of approximately the same height. When the items on the page are of wildly different heights, uh, where you have some that are very tall and some that are very short, they don't look so great. They create uh, a lot of empty space. But if the items on the page are of approximately the same height, you can use the CSS Flexbox style layouts to sort of regularize uh, what they look like, and the appearance is reasonably attractive. All right, next item. And this is sort of the last uh, topic of this presentation. We have, we have new features for DLM. DLM stands for Distributed Layout Manager. It's the, the layout subsystem within uPortal. Uh, and I need to explain it this way, I think. In, in DLM, in layout management in uPortal, ever since version 2.5, We've actually had, we've been good about having pluggable strategies for choosing the audience of a fragment. Uh, you'll remember, I hope, that DLM thinks of content in terms of fragments. Uh, administrators define fragments, they define the content of a fragment and the audience of a fragment. And as a user, when you log in, if you are a member of the audience of a fragment, then you receive the fragment in your, in your layout, in your experience. Uh, in the portal. The content of that fragment becomes a part of what you see when you access the portal. Well, ever since the beginning, we've always had good capabilities around uh, pluggable, configurable strategies for who is in the audience of a fragment, for configuring the audience of a fragment. But we've only had one strategy for configuring the content of a fragment, and that is based on uh, the fragment owner. For each DLM fragment, of course, there is there's a, a user account in the portal that represents the owner of the fragment, and that user account, yeah, it's not a flesh and blood user, it's a uh, user account, a row in the database. But that fragment owner account has, has a layout in the portal, and the content of that owner's layout is the content that is given to users who are in the audience of the fragment. We've had very good pluggable strategies for configuring the audience of a fragment, and we've had really only one strategy. It's a decent strategy, but really only one strategy for configuring the content of a fragment. Well, in your portal, uh, perhaps 5.1, perhaps 5.2, in any case soon, we're looking to blow that wide open. We are looking to support pluggable strategies for defining the content of a fragment. This is very cool for a number of reasons. Let me illustrate what you'll be able to do. When DLM fragments can support this kind of thing, you can build the content of a fragment based on contextual information on the user who's accessing the fragment, you know, so fragments will be heavily individualized, or they, it will be possible to make them heavily individualized. User contextual information, like the user's attributes or the user's group affiliations. You can use contextual information 
about content objects in the portal, like portlet metadata, what categories does this portlet belong to, you know, maybe keywords associated with the portlet. Uh, you can use contextual information, you know, other types of contextual information as well, like what time of year is it, which, which term is it, uh, how many weeks is it until exam time. Those, that kind of data can go into the process of choosing the content of a DLM fragment, you know, once we kind of break open DLM uh, and merge this enhancement that we have in, in process. <clears throat> Another example of the kind of information that could go into these calculations is, is data from uh, learning analytics. This could be something from uh, a learning record store, perhaps a Perio Open LRW. Learning analytics data that you have in an XAPI or Caliper format. We are looking to introduce a new component, a new piece into this puzzle that we're calling a data processing engine that we can teach, that we can give pluggable strategies for crunching on uh, all this data or some of this data in order to make, you know, to, to associate users with content, to do content matching and produce the content of a DLM fragment, you know, on a per user basis. Uh, last component in this puzzle, of course, is the portal server, which is both the consumer of the, of the matching that the data processing engine does, as well as potentially a provider of learning analytics data based on XAPI or in the future maybe based on Caliper. So uh, I know that's a mouthful. I have this diagram here to illustrate uh, better what we're talking about. In this illustration, you can see in the center towards the bottom, or actually at the very bottom, you can see a user using a computer, using a browser to access the portal server. Uh, traffic flows uh, back and forth between the user's browser and the portal server. The portal server is producing, is potentially producing evidence, uh, producing learning analytics data that it sends to uh, the LRS, to the learning record store. Perhaps that LRS is open LRW by Aperio, perhaps it's a different one. But in the best case, the learning record store is also gathering evidence, not just from the portal, but from other systems on campus, uh, especially from the LMX, uh, learning management system. Maybe it is Moodle, maybe it's Canvas, maybe it is Sakai. But uh, the LMS, other systems on campus, perhaps the library system, perhaps even the SIS, providing uh, evidence about uh, the, the user's experience and, you know, and, and progress within the university to uh, the LRS. Uh, and then over on the right in the middle row, uh, this illustration shows the data processing engine. At this point, we're looking at using a technology called Apache Spark to implement the data processing engine. This component uh, is responsible for taking the data from learning analytics from the LRS as well as the contextual data from the portal and elsewhere. Again, contextual data like uh, user attributes, like user group affiliations, like uh, metadata around content objects in the portal, perhaps other uh, contextual information like the time of year or the time within the term. Uh, it uses, the data processing engine uses all this information based on pluggable strategies to match users with content. Uh, it can provide these matches back to the portal and the portal knows how to include these matches in, uh, will know how to include these matches in a DLM fragment going forward. All right, well, you know, this is one picture and I think this is helpful uh, illustrating what we're talking about here. It is a bit complex, but here's another picture to sort of bring this full circle to connect all the dots, uh, we will be able to do things like have, uh, you know, a section on the portal page or within the portal somewhere with recommended content. You know, welcome, uh, Stephen, student. Here is the portal, here is all of your regular content, and, and in addition to the regular content, based on what we know about you, uh, your attributes, your group affiliations, your experience using the portal and other tools on campus uh, and your success or, or, or lack thereof. Here are the content objects within the portal that we recommend for you. It's uh, a recommender system for you portal and uh, it opens up a lot of possibilities.
you have any questions about this or about uPortal, please don't hesitate to contact the, the list uh, at um, uPortal-user at aperio.org or uh, reach out to me, awills at unicom.net. We'd be happy to hear from you.